I'm sitting with Dr. Daniel Kraft, who's our track chair for medicine. Uh, Daniel, thank you for being here, and I'd, I'd love to ask you a few questions about your talk today. So I think in covering the area of medicine and neuroscience uh, at Singularity University specifically, we're trying to look at where all these integrating uh, exponential technologies are affecting medicine and healthcare, even wellness. And so um, what's amazing about, I think, the Singularity experience is everyone gets a taste of where things are now and where they're rapidly emerging. And I think all of those touch on medicine, from the computer to nanotechnology to, um, to robotics even. Uh, so what I tried to cover today for this SU session was to take a look at a few of those. So for example, everyone's aware now that uh, you know, we've had increasing computational speeds and devices uh, that are shrinking. That's been very much in play in the genomic space. So we've moved from the point where the human genome uh, originally 10 years ago cost $3 billion to do one genome over several years, where it's very likely uh, in the next couple of years we'll have a, a sub $1,000 genome that could be done in a week or less. Um, and that's going to provide a lot of uh, power to the whole realm of personalized medicine, which everyone's interested in, sort of the ability to treat patients with the right drug at the right time, uh, with the right dose, um, and even to provide uh, predictive medicine and prevention and involvement by the patient. So I think one, uh, one sea change that's going to occur, which is also integrating it into the IT and the web world, is that f individuals are going to have a lot more understanding of not only their genomic information, um, but aspects of uh, their um, health care um, to the realm where they'll be able to better predict and maintain their wellness, but also if they have disease, um, uh, utilize better um, software and interactivity to optimize their, their health care outcomes. When do you expect mainstream usage of uh, EMRs? So EMRs, electronic medical records, are sort of becoming uh, quite common. You know, I'm used to having stacks of medical charts, yay high, and digging through them to find information. So EMRs are evolving. The problem to date has been there's different standards at different hospitals or different systems, and they're not always communicating together. And I think there's a new push to try and make standards in, in the data so that they can be cross-system optimized, such that a lot of deep dive information epidemiologically and results-wise can come out of that to, uh, to both uh, optimize patient and data-driven care. So I think that's going to be a big thing that emerges uh, through the EMR and also the personal health record where you can, through your iPhone, access your medical record. Um, if you show up in a random emergency room, your, your medical record may be in the cloud in a sense and can be accessed directly. And that should really improve uh, efficiency and costs as well. Hmm. Your, your colleague Chris Ducharme gave an enthralling lecture about neuroscience. I, can you talk about some of that? So neuroscience is really, I think, uh, a really exciting area and starting to have real impact on potential clinical applications. So we've learned a lot about the brain over the last couple of decades. One of the really exciting aspects, I think, is the aspect of what's called brain-computer interface, where we can uh, read signals from the brain, and in some cases, right to the brain. So, for example, uh, a, a group out of Brown University led by John Donahue and Lee Hochberg has, have a group called BrainGate, where for quadriplegic patients, patients who can't move at all, they can put a small uh, postage-sized stamp on the motor cortex, um, and that can read out the signals that say, I want to move my hand, um, and essentially thought translates to motion when we have an intact spinal cord. In quadriplegic patients, they can take that signal and then the patient can actually move a cursor, uh, type on a keyboard, control a wheelchair, a robotic arm. So that's an example of brain-computer interfaces, the next generation of which will probably be fully implanted, Bluetoothed, and will, I think, enable a lot of interactivity um, for patients who have significant um, uh, disabilities, as well as the ability to control new technologies like the robotic arms being built by Dean Kamen, uh, which have a lot of you know, huge improvement, exponential improvements over the prior, prior version. So the ability to, to essentially interface the brain with the outside world directly is coming downstream as well. And uh, where is medicine starting to leverage some of the discoveries in, say, nanotech uh, and computing in other areas? Uh, well, medicine is leveraging uh, computing in many ways. I think one thing that's going to start happening is the integration of uh, what's called systems biology. It's not just what your genome is, uh, that your base genome, you know, say your base genetic risk profile based on what, what genes you're born with. It's going to be an integration of your proteome, which, what, what genes are being expressed, and learning how to measure those in real time, integrating that with your environment dome and your ex what, what things you've been exposed to. You know, the whole nature-nurture thing comes to play. Um, so integrating all that in a systems biology way, potentially leveraging artificial intelligence to start interpreting that data to, to the point where 
there's this sort of health stream of information over you as the individual that you can start to understand, um, make that actionable, both for you as an individual, both for your wellness and for disease therapy, and that can have interplay with your physician. So using exponential technologies, hopefully in a decade or so, when you walk into your physician's office, they're gonna have you know, your, hopefully, potentially your whole, sequ whole sequence of your genome available. They're gonna know some of the risk predilections that are derived from that. You'll be able to do a, a spot test of your blood that can measure thousands of biomarkers at once and give a picture of where your, uh, where your health status is and potentially tracking disease or therapy and integrate that in a smart way so that you're not getting reams and reams of data, but it's, it's put together uh, in, a, in a useful, integrated manner um, that can lead to both better prevention and treatment. Great. I'll mention one other area Please that's do. exciting. Um, so my field is more is regenerative medicine, focused in stem cell biology, and there's been a lot of hype and hope around the stem cell world um, in terms of what its potential application is gonna be and when, when, when that will happen obviously a lot of political debate around embryonic stem cells. I think one of the most exciting th realms in the stem cell world is now the ability to take, let's say, a skin cell from your nose, which has the same DNA as you had in your embryonic stem cells when you were eight days old, and essentially um, realize that that DNA is there. We can reprogram that cell now to have the stem cell uh, program essentially turned on, and it's been only shown in the last three years that we can reprogram adult cells from, let's say, skin to turn into pluripotent stem cells are almost equivalent in power and activity of an embryonic stem cell. That's done in mice only three years ago, in humans about two years ago, and uh, only the last few months we've had the ability to do that in human cells without using viral particles to reprogram them. So essentially you're saying we could take any cell and reprogram it to be a, a, a really potent stem cell. Exactly. Um, Stem cells have different levels of potency. Embryonic stem cells are pluripotent. They can turn into any of the 200 tissue types you have in your body, theoretically. Well, let's say adult stem cells are a little more limited in their ability. The excitement here is you can take a skin cell and reprogram it to act like a pluripotent embryonic stem cell. For example, make your own personalized tissue lines if you need them in the future. New cardiac muscle, new hepatocytes from your liver, new skin cells if you had a burn. Um, and that's gonna potentially have a lot of power in the future of regenerative medicine to make your own personalized lines they cannot be rejected like they would be today if you had cells that are derived from embryonic stem cells. And as we learn better how to control the fate and, and differentiation of these pluripotent cells, either embryonic or skin cell derived pluripotent cells, I think integrating that with tissue engineering, nanotechnology, bioengineering, we're gonna start building organs and constructs which uh, can be created outside the body uh, and used to uh, uh, affect uh, regenerative medicine, which is the ability to repair replace and regenerate tissues that have been damaged by aging, disease, or, or trauma. Wow. So uh, there's something I'd like to confirm with you. Uh, a year ago when we were chatting, I asked you whether um, how close we were to, uh, there's 3D printing shops that are using 3D printers to print quote unquote um, kidneys or human organs with, with uh, um, stem cells. Mm -hmm. And you said there's several labs around the world that are working on prototypes. Mm -hmm. Is that still true? Has there been advancement in that area? So the concept of 3D printing is certainly one of the exponential technologies that's affecting everything from building small gadgets to houses. And the same technology can potentially be applied to tissue engineering. So in many cases, if you want to build an organ, it's not just one cell type, it's multiple cell types. It might have blood vessels involved, and you know, the liver or the kidney are complex organs. Uh, and the potential here is to print 3D constructs, maybe with the biomatrix, and then on top of that, integrated in using actual inkjet printers modified, which instead of ink, they have different cell populations. So you can actually layer the, let's say the collagen matrix and different cell populations in a 3D printed structure. And those cells might say be cardiomyocytes and blood vessel progenitors. And from that, you can start to build an entire organ. Um, and that may be built de novo, or it could then go into a bioreactor and finish maturing. And then potentially it could be essentially hooked up to the vascular system and be a replacement organ. So one of the big challenges of, of uh, regenerative medicine and tissue engineering is how to really build these 3D constructs and then hook them back up to your blood supply. And I think 3D printing is one exciting technology that's being applied to, um, to this field to potentially sort of, again, grow organs on demand outside the body. And how quickly can I grow hair? Well, interestingly enough, there are several groups working on stem cell and regenerative medicine type technologies for the major public health uh, uh, disaster of, of male pattern baldness. And essentially what they've been able to do is identify 
the follicle stem, ce stem cells, uh, or, or hair stem cells that are in your, in your scalp, and turn back on their programming, reactivate them. Um, so instead of actually having to transplant hair follicles, you can reactivate, um, there's a, something called the WIND pathway, and there are several companies and groups working on ways to do that. So there's hope for you yet. Wow, I better start buying some shampoo. There you go. <laughs>